everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me in the back? Uh, oh, is it good in the back? All right, very good. Um, welcome, welcome to the very last Tony Wojak event of the winter season. Um, thank you all who are here for the first time tonight or who have been able to make all four or anything in between. We're always happy to see you and uh, we appreciate your, your attendance. We want to uh, let you know again that we, this Tony Wojak events are sponsored by two local organizations uh, and we've been working together to arrange these presentations for now 13 years. Um, one is the Washburn Area Historical Society, or otherwise known as WAM. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the Washburn uh, Area Mu Museum. That's uh, it's just a shortened ver version. Yeah. And then the, uh, our organization is called the Washburn Heritage Association. And we want to thank the Harbor Table for providing this welcoming environment for us once again. And special thanks to our loyal bartender, Cooper, who loves history. And also to Washburn teacher, Andrew Grimm, our videographer, for their continuing help, both Cooper and Andrew. Uh, Andrew's videos of previous Tony Wayak festivals can be viewed from a link. They can, well, you can find them several ways. Um, the <coughs> museum has copies of CDs that have been um, burned, and the library has copies of CDs that you can check out from the library, or you can go to the Washburn Heritage, www Washburn Heritage <coughs> Association, no. Washburnheritage.org. That's it. <laughs> www.washburnheritage.org. And just about every Tony Wyack festival that we've had over the 13 years, maybe not quite that, but has you can you can view from that site, and it's it's kind of fun to go back and even the ones you may have seen before, it's fun to watch them again. Um, and I I might mention that we've just updated our website. It's got a new look. So if you you've been there before and you go there, you're not in the wrong place. It's just got a brand new look. It's a little more easy to navigate than it was before. So I encourage you to um, to do that. Um, finally, a very heartfelt thanks to the Washburn Community Education Foundation. They um, gave us a grant this year that helped pay for all this equipment, so that uh, our audience can and our presenters can have a better experience, so we really appreciate that. Um, and um, I'm going to turn this over to my friend David, uh, and he's going to introduce our speaker tonight. Okay, our speaker tonight is Les uh, Waters, right here, and um, I, he's president of the Bayfield County Historical Society. <laughs> Uh, and he lives, um, uh, he lives on Pigeon Lake, down uh, n near Drummond. And uh, uh, so it's, uh, um, and I, before I say, we will have uh, other um, history lectures now that will start in the summer, probably in June. So we'll have four then too, so you're welcome to come. So uh, please welcome Les here, and uh, um, it's, uh, he, he's our speaker tonight, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I put this up here, and I was accused of being Gordy Sorensen, yeah. but I'm not. <laughs> Let me get, here's Gordy. He was uh, with us until 1986. He lived through most of the, uh, the Drummond uh, sawmill days down there. We had our centennial in 1982, and he did the centennial book, and it's about that thick, and I don't know uh, how he ever compiled that much, much information, got it typed up and got it into print on there. But he's quite a guy along the way there. Okay, for, first of all, the timeline, this is 1882 is when the mill started. And 
ended up in 1930 in November. Uh, it was during that particular time. 1882, now the idea with the lumber mills, Washburn, Ashland, Bayfield, they were in operation. Why? Water. Yeah, the water. They're up there. Okay, now we get down to Drummond, and now we have to have the railroad come through. And this is the trees were down there. They, uh, all kinds of things. And so they came up with the trees. They got to Cable, Wisconsin, south of Drummond, in 1880. And at that point, the Drummond people uh, put their materials, uh, their saws and stuff, on a, on a sled and took it to 10 miles into Drummond. Well, they get into Drummond and there's nothing. So they had to set it up. And basically, they logged the logs around Drummond with this portable mill they had, just so that they could build, build the mill down, down on, in the, uh, the uh, mill pond down there. And in 1882 or 1883, they started the operation on there. We're going to see just what we have here. First of all, the uh, forced type of thing they had, they were buying this, they ended up with like 80,000 acres that they purchased. I'm going to show you a map as we go along there. The people who worked these, now think back there in 1882, what kind of people were coming that would come to a mill like this? Foreigners, yep, they're from places there had little hope to improve wretchedly poor lifestyles. This is over Europe now. And if they were farmers, who got the farm? The oldest son. So here, and they had big families. So how would you like to put, put yourself in that area? You get on a ship, that a sailing vessel, and where did they end it up? On the East Coast. Lots of people there. Not familiar with the English language. The possessions they had, they had no shelter. They're coming in with their backpacks now. Little or no food. Uh, few clothes and belongings, and probably little or no much money. And knowing New York and that crowd down there, I wonder how much, how quickly their money went, one way or another, back alleys, whatever on there. Okay, so here comes. They had to get to uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota to, to work the logging. So that they probably got on board the ship and maybe helped out along there. Logging camps, okay, what, the, what the camps had these, they had a shelter, and we're going to see those. They're crude, but there was a roof. They had a bed. We will talk about that. They also had heat that you'll see there. The meals, this was the biggie now. The meals, they had three hot meals a day, 6,000 to 18 or 8,000 calories per day. And you're going to see these loggers, and you're not going to see an obese logger in the whole picture here. So what do they got? Now they've got a shelter, they got room and board, and the meals, their work day now, they're working for 12 and a half cents an hour. Okay, 12 hour day, you know, from can see to can see. So they're looking at 12 and a half times 12 is a, a buck and a half a day. They work six days of the week, Monday through Saturday. So you're looking at like $9 a week on that. Uh, not much to go for, but when they're in the middle of the woods, where are they gonna spend their money anyway? Uh, unless you happen to go to uh, to Hurley, yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't bring that Hurley up here. Back then, what were the three H's, the three most dangerous places on earth back then? All of them with H. Hurley was one. Hayward, Hayward and? Hell. Hell, got it, okay, yeah. <laughs> so the, we got that out of the way, so it's, it's something different here. Uh, work days, they had a whistle on the mill. Everything was uh, powered now. Wake up 4.30. They start the mill at 5.15, end of the day is 4.30 in the afternoon. So they put in a full day, they put their 12 hours in. Uh, wages, I talked to that. Chief engineer uh, got a $1,050 a year, the foreman $1,000. Soft filers got $4 a day. Now remember these other guys are only getting a buck and a half a day. We're gonna talk about the sauce here. Then they got scalers and all kinds of people. Okay, this particular thing here, this uh, presentation is going to show the density of the trees that we're talking about, the size of them, the logging camps, methods used in the early days to cut, skid, deck, haul, load, transport the logs to the sawmill. Okay, what season of the year did they work in? Take a look. In the winter. Okay, so they're uh, working in the winter, which a couple things. First of all, the trees don't have the sap in them. They didn't want the, the sap so much when they were sawing that. 
it was easy to skid the logs. They get on there, we're going to show the skidding mechanism that they have on there. Uh, this logging in Wisconsin actually began in 1819. Uh, remember, what, what, was the or what was the date that Wisconsin was put into the Union? 1848. 1848, good. So this is 1819, down in the Black River, down Black River Falls. See the men, see them down there at the bottom? Now you take a look at this, stand of line. Uh, they estimated there were about 44 trillion board feet in these trees that they had down there, and they were totally untouched. These were, were trees that went through most everything they had. This particular person is a, uh, there you can see a roadway. Uh, they had to go through there. Basically, the idea back then was forests were kind of an eerie place to be. You know, handsome gravel and, and uh, the rest of them down there, the deep, dark woods. Daylight in the swamp. Now, we kind of think about that, as a, especially if a deer hunter, if you're you know, waking up with a hangover and everything else, and now it's daylight in the swamp. But actually, that term came from the fact where they were removing trees, and finally the sunlight could hit the ground. And you take a look and you can see why here. Four man here. Take a look now. This particular tree, we're going to uh, come back to this, is probably ready to be taken down. Now, how can you tell at this point? Can you see it down here? They have a swamper. To, to, when they saw these down, they had somebody called a swamper came in and actually took the bark off as to where they'd have to saw it. Oh. Otherwise, the bark, the uh, saw would get the bark in it and go from there. And we'll talk about the different jobs you got there. But take a look there, that, that particular one. Now, Drummond is fortunate enough, we have just outside of town, we have a virgin pine forest where they save the trees. And you'll see in there some trees that are, are this size along the way there. Kind of neat to see that. Here's a couple down here with the uh, horse and buggy. This was taken, not, this is Pigeon Lake, this is where we were. Uh, we've got big, big trees. Pigeon Lake is a place that flooded out about four or five years ago. One night we had 15 inches of rain. We lost our pier. I, I wondered what, where the devil's a pier, and I looked out and the sun finally came out. Here it is, it's under about four feet of water. So we had a heck of a time. We still got cabins that uh, they're derelicts at this point. They, they are not, not, not going to be able to sell, salvage them. But this would be the Pigeon Lake area here. The first part of this, this is the Holcomb Dam. This is uh, not, not what we're talking about here, but this is basically where they, they did most of the work at that point. Notice they've got the waterway. Okay, the waterway works out real well, and if you don't have to they have that, what did they do next? How did they get the boards out of it? That they, but how did they actually get it to the mill? Railway, yeah. Okay, we're gonna see railways all over. In fact, it's kind of neat around where we live. We got those old railroad beds out there. And so we bought three wheelers a long time ago, and we got back there and, and had a good old time, and now we can't do that anymore. We've got to stay with the trails. <laughs> This particular one, now we've got an interesting area here. Here's Lake Superior, here's Schwamigan Bay, this is where we are. This is Lake Owen, south of Drummond, and that water goes from here and goes up to the lake. Down here next to Cable, we have the Namakaga Lakes, and that goes out to the Mississippi. This particular, this turtle flowage right here, or portage here, that they actually have that, they canoe up to this point, and then portage into Lake Owen, and then, then keep on going up there. This is an early way that they, they used to do that. Interesting place, now we're Pigeon Lake, we're out here, and this water goes to the Eau Claire Lakes. And we're only five miles out. So it's, it's quite a deal where this is uh, the Great Divide now, would be right here, and Lake Owen comes through here and goes there uh, along the way there. Now when they first started out, this is a good deal, because here's, here's the mill, here's Pigeon Lake where the, the uh, uh, or not pitch, this is Drummond Lake up here. And they were able to float the logs from Lake Owen, and they, we're gonna show you a flume here too, they had to go through that, it was kind of boggy. And so they built a flume all the way up, and this is where the mill was in, in Drummond. And then from there we got uh, the white, uh, going up to the White River, up to the Delta and places like that. So that worked out pretty well, but after that particular, once they got this logged out, they had to have the railroad, not only to for the logs, but, but to get into the surrounding areas. Here's a map of it, here's Drummond. Here's the railroad coming from Cable. And they came by sled up here to, with the, all the logging equipment, set it up in here in a temporary business. Our, uh, 
buildings that are around that particular thing, and then they, they logged around there and got enough wood to, to, for the mill. Now, if you're to go here, here's Pigeon Lake out here. This particular place is barns, and this would pretty much be Highway A coming up to Iron River would be there. Now, all of these are spurs that they put in, uh, get, getting back in there because, like I told you, uh, Lake Owen down here, they could float it down, which is great. All of those are railroad spurs? You bet. They had to do those, and that, at this point, the, the rails aren't there anymore, and that's where all the, the snowmobile trails and everything else, that, that particular part came out pretty well on there. <laughs> Here are all the, the camps that they had. We're going to see this. This is Drummond. Here's Pigeon Lake out here. Now, the original camp that they had out there wasn't with the Drummond people, wasn't with uh, uh, Owens and the, uh, the boys out there. This is Lammers. They were out here first, and they logged north of Pigeon Lake, and what they did, there was no railroad at that point, they put it on, on skids and went down this way, came down and came across here <coughs> towards uh, Peace Road and they got into the Eau Claire Lakes. So that was their managed. Okay, once it's in the Eau Claire Lakes, their logs floated down to Stillwater, Minnesota. 150 miles that those logs had to go down there. You kind of wonder if they start with 100 logs, let's just pick 100, how many actually got to the mill down there. But that was the first one. Then the uh, uh, Russ Golan came along and we got the mill in Drummond. Now you can actually still find these old places. Uh, Pigeon Lake up, up here. We got back up in here, there's a walking trail and I walked a little ways back there and when they did, they set up their camps, they'd actually dig the dirt down so they didn't have to put many logs and then they would bank the dirt up at the base of these and you can still see the holes there uh, that were back in there. Here's a camp that we have. What do you notice in this camp that's maybe a little askew? Can you see it over here? Oh. Husband, wife, their kids that they've got there. You kind of wonder, first of all, they would, wouldn't have any schools for them, but they're part of that. Now the big question is, you know, okay, the kids are probably the, kind of the pets around there, but what would that woman do? Cook, good. What? Clean. Clean not only that, but probably wash clothes and uh, do, do the things around there that they had on there. So she, they would put her to work. She's also, looks like she's having quite a family along the way there too. To see what we've got here, this is, uh, you can't hardly see where it's banked up here very much, but they had this, this would be the cabins that they have. Take, now we're, when we go through this, I want you to always look into the background. I don't want you to just look pictures, I want you to look into those pictures. Uh, this particular core, I've, I've uh, given this to fourth graders. I just had, uh, generally in the summertime, I go to Ulu, Karen and I go there and give the same presentation to the kids and they just love it. And as, as we go through there, I'm gonna have excerpts along the way as to how the kids see some of these things. And it's really interesting to have here. Do you see any obese people here? <laughs> Not hardly, no. Even 6,000 6, to 8,000 calories per day. Okay, this particular one is a, uh, I'll get it here. Railroad, yeah, this is a, this is a, a company camp that they have. They, this guy would keep track of the, the wages and stuff like that. We'll come back to there too. Here's a guy, I didn't ever notice him before. <laughs> no insulation, look at the icicles along the way. They're just unbelievable. Here's another camp. Now this is really an interesting one. We can see a lot of things. First of all, the guys, the men that are living there, they generally went over here. This would be barracks and probably the dining hall somewhere, this over here too. But look what they have right in here. What that's, what's that full of? That's full of hay. Now take a look. When they first started out, they had oxen. Real good. They didn't move very fast. Here's oxen here too. Then came horses. Look at that horse. Now look at these over here. See, these, the big ones, these are the stock animals. The little bitty ones had a tough time doing that. But these had to bring the Clyde sails over across the ocean and everything else. Then they got the horses and the horses were preferable to the oxen at that particular point. But you see the guys that, out here with their, with some of their tools along the way there. But this was always the thing. They had one rule in the camp, if you got caught mistreating an animal, you were out. No meals, no nothing. You get your stuff and get the hell out of it. And the kids thought that was a pretty good idea. They thought, you know, anybody that's, that's gonna mistreat these animals is, is uh, worthy of not even being there. Another thing they had that we're gonna come back to, when they come back into the area, they would come back in and they were ready for the evening meal, but these animals had to be taken care of before anybody was fed the evening meal. Because you, 
basically what we've got in these camps is muscles. Think about it. Anything that happened had to be by some steam engines came along and we we're going to see the uh, as we go along in there. But everything was muscle power. Here's the Lambert camp here. This is uh, on Pigeon Lake. You can see that there aren't very many logs high because they actually dug that down. And this was uh, this is the crew over here that actually logged this. And you can see they, they did a pretty good job here in the background again. You can see the weather that they've got. But they would uh, put those on, onto a, a sled, take them by horse down to the Eau Claire Lakes and put them in at, for still water. Here's another camp. We've got, uh, this is called the ruts going, but you can see, look at the number of horses here. Okay, now, wh what part of the year are they using horses in oxen? What season? Winter. What are the horses going to do during the summer? Somebody's got to take care of them. People were farming the area. So guess what? The farmers would take their horses in and use them in the wintertime. When there's, you know, what are you going to do around a farm in the wintertime? And then during the summertime, they went back and used these same animals for plowing and everything else. So they were used 12 months of the year. Also, look look at the background here. Are there any marketable trees around that particular area? Now, the next thing, we drove up from Drummond. We got to Mason and the whole bit. Fields all over the place. There are beautiful fields out there. Take a look at what those fields started at. What's that? That's a stump. And we're going to see this along the way there. All you can think about is the early farmers, how much time and energy it took to get those stumps out of there. And what else is there besides stumps? Rocks. Yeah, okay. So give them a lot of, if you look at that, and uh, the parts that they're not using, they're growing trees at this point. Uh, there's just no, no use for it at all. <laughs> yeah, here's one. I, I, look at this. Stump, stump, all the way here. That, that whole thing. Now, how would you like to be a farmer and try to start growing stuff there, going through there? Also, look at the trees. Around this particular camp, we've got some of the trees left there, but not many. Now we get into a little bit of, this is a, uh, where are we here? River, okay. River, man, okay. I'll get to the page here. This particular, oh, this is a railroad car camp. Now this is on tracks, and sometimes what they would do is instead of having them living in the, sh the shacks and stuff like that, they'd actually take these out here, and the, the men would live in that. But you can see they got brush here, but they, they could actually go out there and work that time. They'd be eating out there and everything else here. Here's another camp. You can see where it's built up, and look behind there. Once again, there, there is a, a lot of stuff there. This particular one's a postcard that they had, and you can see that the horses, the big horses that they've got, and things along the way there. It's another one. Now this particular abandoned one, this is just abandoned during the summer. When a camp was to be used more than one year, the owner would hire a married couple to watch over the camp during the summer months. Uh, this could explain the presence of the woman tending her garden. Okay, now, what plant or what kind of garden vegetable could they grow at the base of these stumps? Potatoes, good, hey, all right. Yeah, they could, they, with the sandy soil and everything else, most of their gardens were potatoes. Uh, basically, if they tried to grow anything else, it looks like they got something here. What are they gonna have to compete with? We still do. The deer, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you got all this stuff here, and she's, they're taking care of it. Looks like we got some horses back there and everything else, but they, they did have some care, because they were gonna come back to this, and we can see the inside. Here's another one. Now, we got this particular one. Uh, as you see what we got, we got a few rocks here. This part here would be the part we'd be filled with hay. This over here might be the dining hall, and over here the, the, the cruise quarters that they have here. Here's the camp clerk. Now I looked at this calendar. Can you see the snow outside the window? I looked at that, I was trying to, I wonder what year this calendar was. I'm trying to figure out it's from a feed company. So I took a look. Uh, what months have 31 days in the winter? What, what October? January, December, so we're looking at the, the time there. This particular camp uh, thing kept track of the men's times. The foreman shared a building that also served as a camp store. Essentials that they sold them, mittens, socks, rubbers, underwear, chewing, and smoking tobacco were sold in the place. What the devil are rubbers? Not what you think. <laughs> yeah, they're boots. Remember galoshes or rubbers? Yeah, I was down at Gordon. We had a, one of these down there, and I had a young lady who had to explain to everybody that, about that. I said, no, I don't think Trojan was in business back then. 
<laughs> now, obviously, when I give this to the kids, I don't make this up, but it's also a good deal. <laughs> okay, now, here's the mess hall. Uh, there. The deal was, if the food was good, everybody was happy. If the food was bad, two people, two groups had to leave. Either the workers, enough of it, were getting the heck out of here, or the cook had to leave. Food, remember, three full meals, all hot meals, 6,000 to 8,000 calories, so it's quite a deal. What the devil is this? Go to the Bible. What is it? A horn. It's a horn, but what, what was the, the horn in the lawyer? Gabriel. It was a Gabriel horn. Yeah, they'd have, have that, that they could blow that to come in there and, and actually do that. And the walls were there. And the minstrels. And the minstrels. Now, here's what a mess hall would look like. Now, this this is a little bit different. This is kind of a ritzy one, because what, what were the dishes generally made of during that time? Tin. Yeah, tin or, or pewter or something. This is this is crockery the whole bit here. They're wearing white, white aprons, and obviously this was there. But the, you can see the, where the men would sit down and, and have the meals. And they had the, uh, let's see, good cook, happy, yeah, the help was called the bull cook. Prepared the vegetables, kept the fire going, kept the water handy. So now if they're, those guys are getting up at 4.30, these guys have got to be up there early, really early, and then late at night. But uh, we'll go through some of the, the rules on there. Here's another one. Now we've got, now we've got this, the uh, enamel here. You see everything's upside down. Dishes look to be uh, mess hall ready for eating. Notice the food on the tables, two or three kinds of meat, two kinds of vegetables, baked beans, a standard fare. Also served was bread, cookies, pies, dried fruits, prunes, apples, uh, prunes, apples and peaches. Uh, the camp fed their web, uh, men well or they didn't have any men to work there. So this is a, quite a deal here. This is a cooking staff that they've got there. You can see the pots and pans and they were in there most of the time. Seldom was a kitchen crew dressed in white. White apron was standard. There was no talking rule at the mess hall. While the men were eating, the only speakers allowed were the cook helpers who communicated the need for more food and beverages. So when you sat down to eat, you sat down to eat. There's no doubt about it here. These three, you know, this is, the young kids got a, had a big deal about this. This was the uh, women cooks. They actually had names here. Mrs. Charles Kennenberg, Lily, and Lynn Snyder. Women sometimes worked in the camps as a kitchen crew. Wages were not $9 a week, but $4 a week. And the, the kids had a big, well, yeah, they're out there working as hard as the guys are. They should have that. <laughs> Women did not stay long at the work, as the work was hard, the pay was meager, and marriage was possible. Now, can you imagine being these two young ladies about with 100, 150 men around there? Uh, if the cook was married, his wife usually worked in the kitchen along with the women. So, okay, dinner time, there's the horn. The Gabriel horn, they kind of screw. Now, this is, this is the evening meal. And I brought this up to the kids. Why are those guys standing around and not in the, the lunch hall? What are they waiting for? I just told you a little bit earlier. We don't eat until... The horses are fed. The horses are fed. Yeah, these guys are waiting their turn now. They're, out there screwing around having a good old time. Once again, you don't see any overweight type of people there, but that Gabriel Horn is something different here. Uh, let's see, what do we got here in that? Uh, crew returning to camp for dinner, the cookie with the long horn to Gabriel. Gabriel was used to call the men from the woods for mealtime. Horns were about five feet long, could be heard up to a mile away. Some people got good enough that they could actually play a tune on it. What particular nation has those great, not a Gabriel horn, but those great big ones? Switzerland, yeah, they got, remember those wee, those ones we were over there. Sometime, now the luncheon meals has to be a hot meal, so this is, they've got a, uh, this set up, they've got a sled over here. Uh, men were working too far from camp to walk for the noon meal, the meal was taken to them. Now, look at this. A noon meal around a fire on a stormy day. Look at, and there's not much around there. These men had to eat just as quick as they could. Why? What were they eating off of? What kind of metal plates? What's going to happen if they don't eat fast? It's going to freeze to the plate. You see, you got that. How'd you like to be in a snowstorm out there and that? And you can see how they're dressed and everything. But that was their, their meal that they had out there. Oh, room and board. Here's the inside the, the rooms here. Sleeping shanty. Take a look. Look it up here. 
Do you suppose there's a few odors in that place? <laughs> that guy is there. This could be a barber over here. They did have a barber along the way there. This is, there's men are sitting on the de deacon bench here. They have the part in here to sharpen stuff. This is where their beds are up here, which presents a problem. They just kind of sit around, probably this is in the evening. They got the clothes hanging from the rack, stove drying. One can only imagine the odors. Sleeping. Look what they're sleeping on. Hay and that. Double bunks were put, built one above the other using straw for mattress. This mattress was a good place for lice, bed bugs to reside. Men are sitting on what's called a deacon seat. On a work day, the men were in bed by 9 o'clock and up again at 5. So they did get their eight hours of sleep. But, uh, you know, it's just one of those where finally we can imagine the itching and stuff that they have there. Sometimes they had music. Somebody would play along the way there. Uh, Caps would have an employee who could play the fiddle, accordion, mouth organ, would play for a group on Saturday night. Now, this is big. Now, they're not going to have to work Sunday. They get that day off. Sometimes there'd be a dance during which time some of the men would tie a handkerchief around one arm to indicate that they were for the female dancing part. Lights were out by 11 o'clock. Imagine those poor girls having to work in a place like that is to try not to, which one am I going to marry here? Okay, now this is Sunday. Uh, Sunday, rest and laundry. It's called boil-up day. Day to wash the clothes, boiling them in water, kill the lice, get the dirt out. Notice two men, oh, damn. I didn't mean to do that. I got Okay, over here, they're actually wringing their clothes out, so they got this part here. What was the greatest invention for the housewife? <laughs> the washing machine. Hey, good. That was the washing the woman. Can you imagine having to put that out there and boil the clothes and wring it out like that? The washing machine was the greatest thing that was around there. Now, I want you to look carefully at this picture. This is the same thing. What do you see that's not for real? Now, this is Sunday morning. Can you see it? What's this right here? Pouring it into a glass. What is that? That's the yeah, liquor bottle. What's this over here? Boxing gloves. They had, back then, boil up day. Uh, take a look at the, the group around here. Notice the men with the boxing gloves and the two men with the whiskey bottle. Most camps have rules that forbid alcohol gambling or fighting on premises. So there's another one. We got They can't talk at the meal, but they can't horse around with this. They, they want liquor, they, they go to town. Uh, Mason, we talked about Mason. You go through Mason North up there. The town is on the left, on the, on the west side. Over there in the farmland, this is where the, the, uh, the taverns were in Mason. I, I was looking at that. We, the, one of the tabbies had one time, we stopped by and went in there, and here's these old pictures of Mason in there. Uh, but you, the, people, the guys that got in trouble were the guys that went to Hayward or, or wherever they're coming back again. But they'd have to walk most of the time to get there. Can you imagine walking 10 miles to a tavern and then crawling back? <laughs> It'd be pretty tough to do. But it's kind of interesting, the things that they had. Preparing for work. Okay, here we go. Now I want you to look at the saw. Most of the saws that we have around the, our uh, garages and stuff like that don't have that kind of a deal on there. They used to be that way. The first saws were the ones with the little bitty bee things. What happens with those great big trees when you're doing that? The sawdust gets in there. It doesn't bring the sawdust up. So they developed these. Somebody came along and said, well, if we take some of those out in between times, in between the little ones, now the sawdust can come out, out of the, uh, the parts there. You see the saws that they had there. Here's a little grinding wheel. The guy's even got a puppy dog there. But that, they're all set to work. These guys up here probably have cant hooks for turning the, the things over there. I don't know what that is. Remember we said there's no drinking? That looks awful, <laughs> a little lot like a whiskey cake there. Right? It, it's kind of fun to, to, to look at what, what some of these pictures show. This particular guy now was not a logger. Uh, let's get him here. Oh, this is T.J. Tommy Thompson. Uh, traveled to the camps all over Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, selling items of jewelry, watches, rings, chains, stick pins, and so on. Lo owned a large St. Bernard dog that pulled him on a sled from camp to camp. So he was kind of a, a salesman that they had around there. And that poor dog's got to pull him around there. But it was, actually, it's, it's great to see these old pictures, and they actually have names for them. Now we're getting into the pay scale here. 
we're going to talk about that. Notice here, remember we had that one picture where that guy was leaning on the tree? These guys go out there, there's actually four to a group. There's two saws, and that's what they do with these saws. They have a swamper. His job is to make the things easier for that, to get the bark off the tree. Look at what he did down here too. See that guy's kind of standing on a plank there? And going through there, uh, says there are four men, two sawyers, one swamper, and a skidding teamster. Now either with horses or, or they'd have the uh, oxen. Use this with horse. This shows two sawyers with a two-man crosscut, the down a pine, swamper removed the bark, cutting area to prevent it. Note the height of the stump. Lumber companies did not care about the height of a stump. Years ago, a man and his two sons owned a shingle mill and used that wood from the high stumps to, to have it. Now, what else would, would make the stump high? It's not in this picture, but what, what, what's generally over the ground in back here? Snow. Lots of snow, and sometimes they, they've got that up there, they can't get any lower, and then the springtime comes around, here that stump six or eight feet high, and that's where the snow was. Sounds like last year, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> I got to tell you, we came up from Drummond and went through this. We're looking for snow on the way up here. <laughs> they just had the, uh, 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 well, the Berkey's going to be this weekend. They got to have that. But we had the bar stool races in Drummond. And they had to make snow for that. So that was kind of, kind of a hilarious type of deal there, too. So they had all kinds of people over there watching those, those guys go down there and he's on the sled. Here's another one, the two SARS. Notice how fat they are. <laughs> they used to call this a misery whip along the way there. This doesn't look like the, the swamper did too good a job here, did it? Mm -hmm. But they would actually have to make a cut, the V cup, and then go around the other side to get the tree down. And this isn't a very big tree along the way here. Harvesting a thing, then they knocked it down, then they had to cut the, the uh, swamper would cut the, the limbs off. Now I'm looking at this. There's it doesn't look like, it looks like there's nothing underneath this. I'm looking at the way they're sawing that, and what's going to happen is that, what's going to happen to that saw? It's going to bind, isn't it? Now I'm wondering, what the devil did they, if they had something like that, and, they, and with a chainsaw you're constantly turning it over and everything else, they, they probably couldn't do that. But what would they do if they stuck that saw? They must have had wedges or something, or they could get through until it gave, and then would they have to saw underneath the other way? So you kind of, kind of wonder about that. This is timber here. This uh, tree here. Now here's a tree that's going down. Why is this looking like this up here? Old film. Old film. Remember they had, to, you had to smile for quite a while and now smile. And this thing is going down so fast that that's all the camera picked up. Take a look at what they got. That might be the only good tree that's left in that patch over here. Look at the rest of that scraggly stuff that they got there. So they, but they're down below there. These guys are really good about which way the trees are going and everything else here. Then if it gets caught up there, if it got caught up in that tree, what did they call that? Widowmaker. Widow yep, they try to get up there and try to saw that rascal out of there. Here's the, the thing. He's got a can hook. And they got their broad axe there. They got their saw going through. So this would be it. The only person you don't see are the, uh, the, the teamsters here. They're bucking up a tree, trim the branches. Swampers cut the skid road so that the logs could be removed from the area. We'll see that skid road here pretty quick. But those trees are heavy now. They did a study on that. One acre of land sold for a dollar and a quarter when they, when the Russ Cohen went in there and bought that. They figured there were 25 of those trees in there. 25 into a buck and a quarter is a nickel a tree. Five cents a tree for this. But this is the easy part. Now we have to not only cut it, but we've got to load it. We've got to get it into the mill and the whole bit. And then we're done for the year because the, the millers, we're going to see the millers are working on that. Here are our oxen, <laughs> another puppy dog. I wonder if it's the same one here. And turn the page here. Uh, using oxen, oxen were used in the early days. They were slower but steadier than a horse, working better in deeper snow than the horses. Remember, some of these uh, places out here were pretty good. Once again, look back here. Has this been logged up a little bit? It is. This is uh, they're coming through some of the areas they have here. This particular guy, this is Ox Pete. <coughs> Take a look at him. He didn't really go for that nickname. Now, would you have guts enough to go? <laughs> he didn't like it to go up there and call him Ox Pete. Another thing we had, I was showing this to the fourth graders in Drummond, and I had a person there, a fellow with, uh, had his son there, and they lived in the Bibbon Swamp. 
And they, he said, that's OXP owned one of those houses down there. Remember the Bibbon Tavern way back when? And then you've got those houses down there? And the reason they know for sure is because they were redoing a wall. They tore the wall out, and here was a summons paper <laughs> with his name on it, <laughs> sealed back in the wall. So he probably probably didn't, didn't know what it was there. But uh, he, yeah, this is the local, local, local guy that we have here. You kind of wonder what, what happens here. And this looks like kind of like a wire here. All kinds of stuff here, so, but you can see what the, the horses are dragging out, what little bit they have. But you know, there's not very much production to be had back here. It looks like most of it, you can see the stumps back there, they, they took the big ones. Uh, one horse skidding, they s still do that. Here's the horse, and he's skidding that out there. Uh, sometimes the size of the timber was small, only one horse was needed to, to do that. Even nowadays, sometimes you get back there and you can't get the machinery, and it might be good to have a horse there. This is called a go devil. Okay, this is a travoy used during the summer to allow logs to skid over the ground and not dig into the soil and rocks. So what they do is lay the log on there, and then they would actually pull that, and it's just like a sled on there. Otherwise, you're you're pulling against the rocks and everything else here. So go devil is made from the crotch of a tree on there, and they put a board across it. Then we have our big wheels. Back in the olden days, in this area, where did they have a park with the big wheels? Right, right along the lake. It was up at Ashland. I remember up there they had a park and they had one of these there. And I talked to them about that and they said, well, it finally disintegrated and we threw it away. But they actually had a park there. Now this is an interesting thing here with the big wheels. They're going to take these logs and haul them out of there. Well, first of all, if you're going to do that, you can't have any rocks and stumps to do that. But how the devil did they pick those the logs up, get them loaded on there? What's this right here? What's, what's this back here? That's the tongue, isn't it? Straight up and down. This is the line to the tongue. So they've got that up in the air, way up in the air. They don't show it here, but what they do, see the axle? They would have a chain wrapped around that that they would put underneath this. Oh, damn it. I get this. <laughs> get this. Now, if we take that tongue and take it down where the horses are, that chain is going to shorten up and go up in there. Now here's, now, now I can show you this one. Take a look here, can you see the chain? And that, that tongue is down there, and the, oh, there's two in there. The horses are pulling it out. No steam, no gas engines or anything else. Remember, it's all muscle power. And they had to use a, a lot of this pulleys and things like that to make it work out here. But it looks like a good idea. They, they had a chain, here's another chain on there, I think. But to have these big wheels back in there, you'd have to have a road that didn't have stumps and rocks and stuff like that. Now, is this production back here? Look at these trees. This is a this is a good place back in here. You've got some scrawny ones in there, but you've got some good ones along the way. And look at the size of the log. That looks like a red pine that they've got there. Now here's another one. Now you can see it. The tongue is down. See the chain is down that keep it from digging in. Two horses. And back here where that, that axle was, that chain actually shortened up as that thing went down and was able to get those logs off of there. Talk about thinking through a lot of things. Not only did we take the uh, logs out, but these guys are peeling hemlock. See the peelers on there? No. And they got their saw for it. Now what the devil would they need hemlock bark for? Yeah. Hey, all right, it had tannin. That, uh, that's where they got the tannin for the tanning height. Uh, hemlock trees were not cut for lumber. They, according to Gordy, they didn't do it around Drummond, but they actually did it other places. No market for the lumber, but there was for a while there. But the bark contained tannic acids used for leathering companies. Bark was peeled from the trees, four foot sections, and the workers were paid four dollars per cord. Now, I haven't talked about a cord. What's a cord? Four by four by eight. Okay. And the Eight feet is 96 inches, and what did they generally cut the, the core does? Not 96, but what? 100 inches. Yeah, there's always that, that extra. We bought a lot of lumber from uh, from Sealy, the Vortex down there, and he had 100 inch. We'd get a two by four, and, and it wasn't built down. You'd two by four now is what, three and a half by one, one and a half inches? His were actually pretty close to a two by four, but they were 100, uh, 100 inches, and I'd have to lop the ends off, uh, square the ends, but he would actually have it at that point. Here they're loading it on there. Now if you ever get into leather work, it took a lot of that bark to tan one hide. They had to soak it and everything else, and it was just uh, amazing as to uh, how, how far away. Here's somebody's coat, look at that. That's keeping it warm. 
Okay, now we're going to make some railroad ties. Creating, what's this axe called? A broad axe. Okay, this broad, see the broad axe? Now that was used to make railroad ties. See these guys are over there? Now what you do with that broad axe, you get on top of it. See they're standing on top of that log? And they go like this, and they're crowding together for the picture. They're not going to be that close together. They're probably one person. Up. So you're up there, and you're whacking it back and whacking it. So you chips out. They get it all the way down. Then they turn around and come back the other way and knock those chips off. Those guys are really good at that. You can see some of this down here, but that's what they use the broad axe for. Here they are. Yeah, look at look at how smooth those buggers are. Okay, these guys are loading onto the railroad cars. These things were called uh, grub, uh, what the hell? Lug, lug hooks. Okay. See, they're two two man carriers. They got the thing in there, and then you got the little thing that they, they can work on there. I actually found one of those. We got it in the Drummond Museum. I didn't know what it was. And uh, up in Bayfield one time, they had an old filling station down towards the uh, uh, where the marina was, and they finally opened it up, and it was just full of stuff. We, we bought two great big anchors there. And she said, what are you going to do with all I should tell you this. They, uh, she said, what are you going to do with this? And I, I said, uh, Karen was back over. And I said, see that woman I'm married to over there? I have tried cement blocks and chains and everything else, and she keeps floating to the top. <laughs> and so, I'm not going to say it. Those are not going to Karen was wondering why, why they were looking at her when she was going there. But we actually, in there, they had some tools. <laughs> I taught school for 32 years. I can't help it. <laughs> Not that I, I, I take enough from her too. She taught art. I, I taught science down in Madison. We had quite a time, but yeah, we were able to buy one of those, and, and just by going around, we we kind of filled out some. This is once again now we're loading a sled. Here's the horses. We're out here. You see the trees. It looks like they're around here, but once again, muscle power. No, no steam power or anything else. This is called a A-frame wood jammer, also called a gin pole. So what they have to do is get it there, then they've got to attach it to a tree, so they get the cable over there and probably use the horses to attach it. Get it up there, there's a pulley up there, and they were able to, with horsepower now, pick those pieces up and put them on the sled over here, to be uh, down along the way there. This is called a Galloway. Now we're getting steam power along the way here. This particular thing was made in Gallo, uh, uh, Wisconsin, you can see what it is. Here's the railroad tracks down below. Can you see the railroad? So the railroad cars go underneath this, and they're able to pick it off the pile and actually load the cars up. So now we're getting into some steam powers along the way there. This is called a gin pole. Now we're look at out there. There isn't too much around there, and they had to go out and kind of pick up from the log pile. But what they would do is put these uh, get these log piles and then move on. And, and here's the railroad tracks. So we got the train coming. This guy up here is called a topper. He got paid quite a bit. Can you tell me why? <laughs> dangerous, very dangerous. Uh, what happened if you got hurt on the job? Tough luck. If you got, uh, they might let you be around camp to do a few things along the way, but you weren't making the pay that you did before or anything else. This Gordy Sorensen, working in the mill in Drummond, the steam pipe ruptured and he got burned badly. Uh, with the scene, he and another guy. Luckily, the train was there, so they took him to the hospital up at Ashland, and he was up there with that. The bill for the what his hospital bill came back to Drummond Lumber, and guess who ended up with it? Gordy Sorensen. He had to pay his own on that. They didn't have Berkman's comp or anything else along the way there. But this gym pole, you can see up there, it's kind of a, a swingy type of deal, but it's out here, very dangerous up here. And if you got hurt. You know, you, you, you just were out of luck all together. And look at the size of these trees. Look at, he's up there on top, and he's squirreling away around trying to keep out of that. And all, it, it, it's by horses. If something happened to the pulley or something, why, he's gonna, gonna have a problem there. Let me know what that was called. That's one of the donkey. first thing. This is donkey, steam donkey. Now, now we're into this, uh, this particular thing here. See these poles? You ever hear, anytime you ever heard of grub steak? What did you hear? Where was it? You wanted a guy wanted a grub steak. What was it? Mining. Yeah, it was what he wanted. The mining, the grub steak. That isn't what a grub steak was. Actually, these are are grub steaks, and the actual grub steaks were actually on the floating lumber that they float down the river. 
And they would cut these four foot sections and hook them on there to, to keep the logs in there. But they were called grub stakes along the way. And some people, that's what they did in the off time. They would actually see they'd sharpen them down there. But that's where grub stake came along. And look at all the wires and look at this. And look at that guy standing right up underneath that. You know, oh, wow. it, it's one of those. And here's the topper up here. And they're uh, on this. Now, this steam donkey didn't have wheels on it. They actually had sled uh, types of things. And basically, it had a pulley. And the pulley pulled on the, uh, the lines on there. This is another way of loading. You look at this. Is this good lumber? No. Look at how bad that is. Uh, we're going to talk about what that may have been used for. Just look at the background there. This is a, you kind of wonder why they're doing this. But basically, they put these two poles here. The, the horses would be over here and the chain would be there, and they would, the chain would pull it up on top, and this, you know, this is probably a Sunday afternoon picture that they took here. But we're gonna come back to what would they ever use this stuff for? Why, why would they even bother bringing it in on the sled? Here's another one, you can see the loaders here, and probably there's a horse on the other side. I, you can tell this is stage, because what can the horse do over here? The horse had to be over here to do the, to pull them up there. But yeah, we're gonna come across a few of these things on Sunday. Here's another one. Good size. Here's the horses over there. These guys working there. And that was a single chain. Now look at how they loaded that. See the chain going up? And then it goes across because they wanted to load straight up and down. So in between time, they probably have another logging chain under here to go up over top of there. So this loading was, was something else. But what do you see strange in this picture? It had to be a Sunday. This is part way up, isn't it? What do we got over here? <laughs> it's slack, isn't it? So you wonder, they must have had it hooked on the other side over there, but you can see that they're, they're uh, doing it. Now look at the railroad ties. Oh. Now we saw all the railroad tracks around Drummond. When they didn't need that anymore, when these uh, places were gone, they would pick up the, the track and whatever uh, the railroad ties that they could uh, pick up along the way there. And that's why we've got all the trails around there. That uh, That's where they, those used to be. When we first uh, started going on those trails, it was bumpy because they didn't take the logs out and over time, they brought it away, so you're trying to go down the trail and, and bump it all over the place there. What they did was also, let me get this one. That's swing dingo down, cross loading. Okay, we get that one. Uh, they talk about now, this, this is, they're making a road bed here. Uh, sleigh hauling to the sawmill. There were three methods used to haul logs out of the woods to the saw, saw, uh, sawmill. The sleigh haul, the railroads, and the waterways. Okay, Drummond got to use Lake Owen Waterway until all the logs were gone. Now, that, that's why they had to get the train tracks in there. The sleigh haul incorporated a roadbed constructed similarly to a railroad grade, only much wider. Two ruts were dug about a foot deep and eight feet apart. Now, what they're going to do is, you can see that they're doing this. Photo shows a horse drawn and the plow going through there. Because a lot of, now what we're going to do in the woods where the trains can't go, we're actually going to put them on sleds. And these grooves are what they're going to, going to have for that. They had a problem with those grooves, so what did they do? They put water, they got water, and in this particular case, they're... I'll just talk about it. What they have over here, they need water. And this is a water wagon. So they've got that over there. You can see the skids coming up. There's a horse over here. Can't see, he's probably got that. It goes up there and empties that. Here's another one. And what they're gonna do now, see the, the, where the rails are? What they would do with that is in the water, they would come along those trails that were dug out there and they'd fill them up with water and they would freeze. And then they could move the sleds easier over top of it. They had a problem though, see that they're coming down here. What the devil is that black stuff looking stuff? If you were coming down a hill with a load and the horses in front, what would you have to worry about? Skidding, yeah, imagine that going over top of the horses. So what they did, they put hay in there. And that would help to, to hold the, the things down there. Because even on an incline like this, you're kind of wondering, those poor old horses that gets coming down, they're gonna have to run like a son again to keep, keep out of there. So that's what they would do in that particular case. This particular one, now we got our donkey up there. Where we got here? Yeah, they're actually bringing the sled up, up on the, the uh, project there. They had a problem out west with that, where they would have the donkey up and not, not around here, but out west with the big trees out there. They would have the donkey up on top of the hill, and they would be pulling those, those uh, logs along the way there. But you imagine the cable going there. Now, they had to have some means of communication on there 
to, to pull it because the what would happen, here's, here's where they are, but down here the guys had, would have to crawl underneath the logs and put the chain around it and everything else. For them to start that, there was a, a, a rope that they would pull like three times and now they would start it up there. Well, there were cases where that line was so long, a tree would fall on that and those guys would be crushed underneath that, those big logs. The guy thought, well, okay, it not, looks like we're gonna have it here. This, uh, they talked about logging being the most dangerous profession in Wisconsin. Bar not even even nowadays with the thing they got. Here's a corduroy road. Guess where all that crappy looking wood was going to put here? They'd have to go across uh, bogs and stuff. Roadway had to cross the swamp. Logs were laid down across ways to construct a corduroy road. So this is probably where they did that. L look at the background here. It's, you kind of wonder what the trees were all about here. There's not much to there. One thing, Pigeon Lake went down. We had pigeon meadows down there one time, and there's there were corduroy roads along Pigeon Lake uh, all the way through. We used to go over top of it, uh, we're fishing over there, we could see the logs down there. But uh, when that lake went down, well, you could find corduroy roads all over the place. Because basically what they would do, they'd put the logs down and then on top of that, they'd haul some gravel and stuff in there for that. Here we got an average size load pulled by one team of horses, that's two of them. You can see the, the cables they got there. They had to make it, you can see the skids down there and that's where the parts would Look at this. Two teams. Now we got with this Sunday photos. Yeah. All hell breaks loose. So during the week, when men, men would save the best logs, and when they had enough for a large load, they'd load the, log, load the logs during a Sunday, had their picture taken. This activity was accomplished on their time. They get all, you know, here's that, that uh, thing that they used to do that you can see the hook. What did they have to do after the picture? What did they have to do for the rest of the day? take the logs off in there so those horses could pull it. So yeah, they're up there all proud about stuff like that. But you know, when you're out in the middle of the woods where it's, the liquor stores are too far away, this is something that they like to do here. This is a perfect load. Now look at the chains. They got the chains, so this is a sled. They got the chains and then the chains go across, but they got the second layer ready to go up there. That way they can keep the, the chains going up and down along the way. Look at this wood. Isn't this beautiful wood here? Uh, got a log marking seal on that. <laughs> Once again, Sunday, Sunday. Those two, two those four animals are not going to be able to pull it. <laughs> this is a mammoth load of logs, some 30,000 board feet. Now, board foot is 12 by 12 by one inch, and you can see that. You have to believe that two teams of horse could pull the load. There was a competition between the camps, between the lumber companies, to show off the skill of the top loader. Imagine being up on top of that. And how, how did they get them up there that high? They must say, you know, those poles we saw that have it. Uh, uh, even a Galloway couldn't get it up there high enough. So you kind of wonder what did they have to do to get those big, heavy logs up there? Must have been something different. Now we're getting into the waterways. Now spring's coming. And we got the water all over. This guy's called a, a river pig of all things. Down here, they, they went around, they generally had a, a pipe pole that they had for balance and stuff. This was a dangerous job too. These guys, they go out there, they had cocks or chocks, whatever where they actually had nails through the bottom of their shoes where they could walk, walk on those. The thing they had to watch for is if they fell off a log, and it doesn't show, they're, you can see they're in a, a, a holding pen here. This is probably down in Stillwater or something. What would these guys do in the water? Now they get in the water, they dunk down underneath. Now what's gonna happen to those logs? Those logs are gonna come together and they're stuck down under there. And a number of these guys were drowned. And you kind of wonder why they wanted to do it. Okay, to get the water was quite a project here. What they would do is build a, a holding dam, and during the night, the, the water would fill up on that, full of logs. Remember, these are logs back in there. Then during the day, that whole thing would do, they release the, the openings here, and you can see the logs coming out. So they would come out with the water. You could only get so many because, you know, probably that water's shallow. Then they had to wait all night again to build that, that waterway back up there to get those things through there again. Here's the flume that was in Drummond. This uh, actual flume came all the way from Lake Owen through the bogs and stuff to Drummond. And that would come down through there and the mill was down below there. This is a railroad track going across there but you can't see the mill down below. This is quite a long flume. Uh, at this time, we've got this for a hiking trail. Uh, we've got the, down where the mill is in Drummond, we've got the, the uh, uh, in the campground, but it's the, uh, it's the picnic area down there. But we, we, looked, we walked up through there, we didn't find anything. They must have taken all that lumber out of there. And 
now we've got not only the campground down there, we've got an RV park in, in Drummond. It's uh, going very good. I figure Drummond's got water tower, they've got septic, they've got electricity, the whole bit there. And uh, those people that were there this summer, they all came back, just if they've got their things reserved already. <laughs> you got a tough time finding a campsite there in Drummond. We finally figured out a way to, to make some money here. But take a look now. Look at the all of this, that drum is right over here. But look at this, look at the stumps and stuff that are, and not a care in the world. Plus those railroads, well, we're gonna get into the fires too. Remember those railroad trains going across there and the pole and the stuff is spitting out of there? Okay, these are boats that we've got that were used on there, paddle wheels. Log jam, it didn't take care of this. This is probably down by Gordon going towards Stillwater. Look at all the love. Now, once again, those, those river pigs would be out on top of there. Can you imagine going in the water and then can't get back up again? You know, it doesn't take very long. This is a log jam. This is probably down at St. Croix Falls. That's, uh, they had to go down there. Take a look at this. They had to use dynamite in different ways to get that, to get the key log. But you look at this, even these guys up on top here trying to do that, what would happen if those things go out from under you? Or being down here of all, of, all of a sudden where it doesn't. So like California with their mud flat pulls right now, they're having a heck of a thing. Log jams. This is called a Wanigan. Now where have you ever heard of a Wanigan before? What town? Hayward. What oh, damn it. I got that strange finger here. Yeah, this is what they actually had a wanting get done. You go down there to the log rolling festival, and they used to have their German pancakes and stuff in the wanting get. That was actually one down there. Uh, long River drives a large boat with a wanting get accompany the drive. We had the kitchen and sleeping quarters for it. What day of the week? You can see the, the gals out there. This is Sunday, and uh, they're going. Down, uh, the logs are going down through here. These are called batus, French. This forget, their job is, a boat full of these guys are supposed to go over there and get those logs back in the water again. Uh, boat pointed at both ends were used to carry men who kept the floating logs floating. Archie Smith, with a thing over top of this, stick over the right shoulder while standing on the Chippewa River Bap Dam at Little Falls, year 1911, watched the two 16 men overboard turn, overturned 11 of the 16 drowned. <gasps> these guys couldn't swim. And how cold is the water? Darn cold, isn't it? It's just like Lake Superior up there. But those back things over there, they'd take them out there and they'd have to do that. Once again, very dangerous. Here's our river pigs here. Uh, using pipe poles, these logs aren't very big. They're not like the huge ones we saw before. These guys had to be pretty good to do this. And uh, But the pipe poles, it's like you see these people on these high wire acts with their poles out there that actually they could push with them and go from there. The logs were stamped. This is one that uh, down at the, uh, was found near, near the Damacaga River. Out west, what did they do with their cattle? Branded them, what did we do with the logs? We stamped them on the ends and that, when they floated them down the river, they'd uh, separate them down below there just due to the stamps on there. So that's ink? Uh, no, no, actually, burn. no, well, no, they didn't burn, they just whacked them on the end and they'd have them stamped in there. Oh. Now we have the uh, sorted, these are the, uh, uh, sorting pockets that they have now. They come down there and they look for those stamps on there and then they put them in the different pockets. Okay, got a deal. What happened to large cattle drives out west if the guys weren't careful? You had rustlers. Guess what happened here? You got the stamps on the end, still water 150 miles down there, lots of places back in behind there that these people could take those logs back there make a real shallow cut so we don't have that stamp and hit it with their own stamp and send it down the river. <laughs> what did they do with rustlers back then? They hung them. I wonder if they got caught doing that up here, what the heck they would do. But you just uh, can't, can't guarantee anything for real, but there, there's actually that skull dogger here. Now we're talking about the, uh, the railroads. Railroad grades, this is one down there. You can see the trees there. Now the reason they, they have to have this now is to be able to transport the logs after they're, they're cut. You can see the stumps and stuff. So they would actually go along and grade these, now, some, fill in the holes and stuff like that. Then they would put the things down and then they're putting the, the rails on top of that. These are temporary. Once we get all the logs out of there, we're gonna pick those up and use them elsewhere around the area. They actually had a crew that was doing that. Locomotive, oops, 
there you can see that going through there. This is this is typically Drummond. This particular one is the Drummond uh, South, Southwestern Railroad, and this drum this the track is coming through. And look at if you were a person standing on there, that's about how high you'd be on that train. And look at the trees along there. And we have this, we've got this in our museum, and we have postcards on it and everything like that. We're very careful about where this, this particular picture goes. We had a t-shirt company that wanted it. But once you give it out to that, uh, this day and age, you, you've got to have the negative and everything like that. But we, we do a lot with this. We've had banners made up, and we've got uh, postcards and stuff like that. But just, you figure, look at how tall those doggone trees are. This particular one is called a broad uh, type. This is one that that the, uh, they purchased at one time, had a problem with these in the winter. What's, it, what's wrong with the train in the winter? Ice on the tracks. Remember, a lot of them has, had, used to have little sand places in there where they could spread sand on it. This particular type of one was pretty tough to do in the winter time just because those, those things are, couldn't get traction on it very well. They came along with, here's our Galloway again, loading this up. This particular thing's called a limey shade. Take a look at where the wheels are. The Limey was a locomotive incorporated a geared shaft that ran from the steam engine to each wheel, meshing with the ring of gears and the wheels. Wheels generated in this manner would not spin on the tracks. Limey proved to be a powerful locomotive, but the top speed was only 15 miles an hour. So these, these would actually be where they could get back there and, and pull these big loads there. But that's a Limey shape. Got another one. Look at this driver. This is a steam hauler. Steam hauler was a railroad locomotive that ran on rail crawler tracks and was able to pull logging sleds through the woods using railroad. Top heavy, damn, get your finger off it. This guy up here actually steered that. You got your track here. Now you go through there and a railroad track is even. You get out in the woods, is it gonna be even? Not too much, top heavy, what could happen to that outfit? Tip over, steam all over the place, coal all over the place, and that guy is out there in the middle of that. And those guys uh, would, uh, would have, have problems with it. Here's the steering mechanism up here. Uh, sleigh runners, crawler runners were connected to a steering wheel, and he actually, here's with the steering part of it, not very efficient, I don't think. Man sat, steered it. Steering in the locomotive was a dangerous job. Many men were killed when the hauler left the road, tipped over, and started spraying stuff all over the place. But it's a, a different idea getting that. This particular one, this is the Drummond Southwestern going through this. Question, we're looking into these pictures. That train is tra traveling a certain compass direction. Now from that picture, you tell me what direction that train is going, north, east, south, or west? How can you tell, huh? Well, what season of the year is it? Winter. What's shining through the air? The sun, low. Is the sun uh, totally onto that? And the sun's down south, shining on that. So if it's down south, it's going this way, which is which direction? North is there, east. See what you can tell when you look at these along the way here. It's, it's uh, looking at, you know, just another old picture to look at, but you look at things like that. So that's probably going back to Drummond with the ones we had. Then we had to have a crew here that went out and, and worked with the track because the, the main track was between Hayward Cable, Drummond, uh, all the way up to uh, Bayfield and Ashland here. But the, that was a trail, that was one that they had. Interesting one, this one. This is a, let's see here. Keep going here. Well, wherever it is. Yeah, this is, these are telephone poles. Okay, we got the horses. What the devil is this rascal? See this over here? That is on a track and it's got a little thing that goes over to the other track. That's called a Valesa pod that they had at the time. And they'd actually ride that. Drummond, they had two of those. One evening, two, two couples, young kids, got on that, guys and the girls went down to Lake Owen to swim on the railroad tracks. Got dark, the first two came back and made it back to Drummond, the second two didn't. But instead what came there was a locomotive going backwards. Uh, they didn't make it and the next day they had to go down and pick up the pieces. It was a, quite a tragedy down there, but they were on that, that train coming backwards, didn't have any lights on it, they're coming coming back up to, instead of turning the train around, they were there, but they, they got caught on that. 
another one. Here's some more telephone. Take a look, they actually had to go between the two, two parts of them there, big ones. This was down there to the mill at Drummond. They came along with the, the uh, railroad, dumped those logs in there. It was a good deal. You kind of wonder, geez, if you're going to soak up with the water, but actually the water was good because they'd leave them in there and it would kill the bugs. You know, the bugs under, under that we worry about under the bark. So that worked out pretty well. Here's the Drummond Mill. Now it's underwater. The, look at all the things. Look at the background there, too. You can, here's where Drummond was up here. This is quite a mill. It wasn't as big as the mill at, at uh, Mason. Mason had the, the largest one. But this particular, we, when we were opening up those campgrounds up there, we got into a place that had to be a, a total yard of cement with a, a hook on the end of it. We are trying, what in the devil would they use? Can you see in the picture what, what they would use that for? Look what you have here, smokestack, smokestack. Those had to have guide wires. If you look carefully, you can see it. So here that thing was a guide wire to one of these, these tall chimneys that they had going up there. <clears throat> Notice the railroad down there. Here's horses and stuff. This is a picture of the same mill. How can you tell that that's later than the picture I just showed you? What's the dead giveaway if you look at that picture? Hmm? Hey, you guys are sharp. See the car down there? So there, they got that, plus they got this particular thing. This thing, when it, when it closed down, the last log went in in 1930. This, they were dismantling that in 1935. The night, they were using torches down there to, to uh, cut the metal and stuff. The caretaker went there that was supposed to, the night watchman went into town and had supposedly a cup of coffee or something. In between time, this whole thing burned down. Mm -hmm. All of that burned down, which was okay because, you know, what, what are you going to use all that stuff for anyway? But that whole thing burned down here. Okay, back to where the logs are coming in. This particular thing now is a, uh, uh, it's coming up here. This is a, I'll get it, a bull chain. I got that. So the logs have come up. Now it's going to go into the mill for milling. We were able to find part of a bull chain down at the bottom of the lake, and the lake went down one time. <laughs> we also found a, a two-wheeled cart that was down there. And the story was that they, they used that to, to once the uh, two by fours and stuff there, they'd have this cart that would help to take it out so they could put it there, air dried it. Two guys had that and it went down the hill and went into the lake so they just left it. Somebody came along with diving gear not too long ago and found that down there so pulled it out so then they had to treat it and everything and, and uh, we didn't have room for it at uh, Drummond for it so Mason's got it now and it was kind of a, a deal where the horses would sit, uh, take the, the logs out. Here's the bull chain coming up here again. Inside here, now take a look. Now we're, we're uh, taking through this. Bandsaw carries alongside could saw logs up to 32 feet in length, these particular things. Photo to the left, the guy's on there. Now I want you to look there. Do you suppose it's noisy in here? Yeah. Do they have anything over their ears? No. no. What kind of hats they got on there? Okay, crash helmets, right? They don't have that. Do they have safety goggles? No, they don't have that. They're just sitting there. Here's the saw right here, not, not guarded or anything. The hearing, can you imagine the, the hearing of these guys after a while would, would go wacky on there? But they worked there. Here's another one. This is a, a, a bandsaw that went through there. This actually did a better job of what it was. Once again, safety equipment, zilch. Just nothing. Okay, here are the two. This is Barrett. He is the, the, uh, not the first superintendent they had. That Drummond was the first superintendent. And this is Owen, the, the owner of that one of them. Why did Drummond get named Drummond and not Owen? They were looking at, you'd think the owner of the town would have. Well, Frank Drummond was the first one that came up. Remember, they said they came up from cable and the sled? He was a son of a gun to get along with, evidently. So, what did they do up there? They're setting up the, the mill and stuff. And they built a root cellar to keep their stuff through. Some guy took a board and put Drummond on it. Just to, you know, I'm going to show you. Guess who came through but the, the people from the state naming the different towns through. And that's how Drummond got it, because they saw that. Did anybody ever hear the town Aliva, down by Eau Claire? You know how Aliva got theirs? They, 
elevator, it had elevators. So the guys are up there riding elevators and then they, they knocked off at the end of the day, they had Aliva up there, knock off. they came through, hey, that's called Aliva. <laughs> and all it was was elevator. This particular thing now, this is interesting, there's quality uh, planks, these are called patterns. Planks were four inches thick, 36 inches wide, 24 feet long, 288 board feet. I went down to board and they got no knots. I went down to board tents and I said, I realized I could never buy this, but how much a board foot would it be when I talked about it? It was $2.75 a board foot. So each one of those back then would be $792. Back, not when this was done, but back when I checked with board tents. Imagine what it must be now. I'll bet they're, well, you can't buy them. And uh, in fact, when they tore the, the, uh, the uh, store down in Drummond, there was a mad rush to see if they, if they made shelves out of these things along the way. There, we never did find out who, who got some of those. But can you imagine one board being almost a thousand dollars? It's the prices you can't, you can't even build a house nowadays, hardly. Here's the last log. Traveled up. Here's Owen. This guy right here, this is Gordy Swords, he got the back of the thing. But these are all the people that were there. November 7th, 1930. Whoop de doo! What happened at the end of September of 1930 or 1920? That was 1929, was it? The crash. Okay, and here's the last log up here. The people up here, you know, they, they were able to hang on for that till uh, from the, when it started up here. But all these people in the mill, and this is the last one through. So what? Where are you going to go from here? Uh, luckily, people had a rifle. They had a fishing pole. Uh, we, they had the company houses there that they they uh, purchased along the way. But a lot of people had to move elsewhere to try to find whatever type of job they had. But that was the, that was the last one through. Okay, now we get the big deal was, remember back then they didn't give a darn about forest fires or anything else. Here's a CCC camp came in. These guys made $30 a month. 25 of it had to be sent home to the family and they got $5 to spend. But there weren't a lot of places for them to spend money up here along there. And this actually was, was a good deal for them, a good old, uh, uh, not Teddy Roosevelt, but FDR Roosevelt bought that in during the Depression. And it sure helped a lot of people out along the way there. Not only, but the problem was what happened about that time. We had Pearl Harbor about that time. This was a quasi military type of a deal, and a lot of these boys were the first ones that were, were inducted into the service. So, fire towers, they talked they're about. Hmm? Are they yeah, they're planting trees there. Okay. Yeah. It's, they go through and they had the boxes of little trees and you can see the furrows. They made the furrows and they go along and put those in there. And, uh, but they did more than that with all of our CCC camps. Uh, Pigeon Lake was one. Up near Iron River was another one. And you go back there and they did a lot of, lot of things with the, the federal parks and everything else. They went in there and made uh, walkways and, and uh, a lot of stuff like that. So it was a, it was a good program for the kids. They get paid in silver dollars? Uh, I know World War II they paid them in silver dollars. Yeah, the, the remember, my uh, uncle worked in there, and he said they got paid silver dollars. Could there. could have been. That was the best thing to have. Imagine what a silver dollars were now. <laughs> Those pure silver back then. Remember the dimes and the, the quarters. And every fifty, the kids don't even know what a fifty cent piece is anymore, or a two dollar bill. Yeah, I remember we had a. There was a tavern up at. Uh, we used to snowmobile up the Iron River. It's uh, the other other place, or, and uh, she had fifty cent pieces. Betty, I think her name was Betty. She had those. And take them to a McDonald's or something. They're looking at them. Well, you know what the devil is this? <laughs> fire towers they had to have. That's what you saw from a fire tower. Look at how how far you could see on those. That they had those. And forest fire. What was the last one we had? The Gordon fire. That almost got to Barnes. And Barnes is is great for the uh, jack pine. And that's they got all kinds of jack pine there, and the jack pine doesn't rejuvenate unless they have a forest fire. They're just lucky they got that thing stopped at Highway 27. They went across there, but what a fire that was! I I'm on the fire department at Drummond, and I drove into Barnes, and the smoke was way up there, the flames were way up there. I thought, what in the hell are we going to do with something like that? And uh, luckily, the wind caught about 4:30 that day. The wind closed down and it went straight up and they were able to, to uh, stop it at that point. But look at the uh, the things that they've got here, the grass fires and stuff. Here's another one. They used to have problems with the train going through. They're spitting out the stuff and they'd have all that slash along the way there. Now we get in, remember muscle power? Guess what we have for muscle power now? We got a chainsaw. And they talk about that, 
how much a person could do with a chainsaw. Remember those poor old guys were back there back and forth and not one person with a chainsaw. Cutting the notches, not, not a very big tree, but it's, you know, they could knock the tree down in no time. Or back, back then they had a problem. Instead of the horses and the oxen pulling them out, look what we got. We got hydraulics pulling them out along the way here. Bunch them. Remember that the skid poles they had to have, now they just pick them up. These are good sized uh, things in here. Here's one in there. Remember the man hours that it took to do something like that? And now we have them back there that they can do that. Sometimes people still are using oxen. They, get the, they can't get back there with the machinery, so there are some oxen around. I don't know where they are. Horses, he's pulling that thing with uh, trying to get through the tree. Piles of stuff. I always get a kick out of it. Now look at the background. This is in Drummond, and don't realize that we grow trees up here. Uh, I came from the southern part of the state down around Platteville, and we were in the spring down there. They used to have uh, cheese factories, creameries, cattle all over the place, no more. Everything's cash crop down there. That's that, uh, stuff down there. And I looked out over that, the farmer's wood lots where he, he, he they looked like a desert. You know, it's, it was in the springtime, the, the crops were coming in. And then people come up here and get all excited about this. They look a load at this. Now, what are you ever going to do for that? And I said, let's, let's take toilet paper, for instance. <laughs> I, I said, if we didn't have that, what would we have for toilet paper? Okay, way back when, toilet paper, corn cobs, pine cones, Sears and Roebuck catalog. I remember we had, had a farmer and a young kid, I thought, remember the Sears and Roebuck had the glossy pages? I thought, you know, that would make good toilet paper. And that, that was tough on the bunghole, I'll tell you. <laughs> was just one of those. Then they, we've also got a plant up here called mullen. It's a plant about that high that'll grow pretty good, and it's got the real soft leaves, and they call it, uh, what was it, Pioneer's Toilet Paper. They, they use that particular part. But we get into that, okay, if, if we don't do that, you're not going to have any toilet paper, what are you going to do? So <laughs> that helps a little bit. In that forest I talked about at Drummond, this is one of the big trees. It's a virgin uh, pine they got there. This particular tree was struck by lightning. You can see it there. They finally had to cut it down, and we've got a chunk of that outside of our museum at, at that point. So you know, it's, the trees finally get there. Now with the kids, we, the last three are for the kids. I come upon there, and they're dancing around. I said, okay, way back when, who is a superhero way back when? Batman. Batman. And I said, no, I, I think that was a, but who was way back then? He, a great big guy and his sidekick. Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan, yeah, they got it. I said, yeah, with the, oh, with the blue ox and stuff like that. So that was it. So I got a picture of that, of Paul Bunyan. They'd never seen that. So now we got the superhero. Now, what's the, the super villain in the woods? What's the monster of the woods called? Starts with H. Hodag, all right, good, a hodag. In fact, uh, Rhinelander's got a hodag museum. And it, I've got, in, the, in our museum now, I've got a whole placard on that hodag as to what it was, as a total farce. This family had something and stuffed a bunch of animals together and, and went to the sideshows. And the kids were back there behind the screen moaning and groaning. And they had that, it was a real dark place, I guess. And people go in there and that, that hodag, and the people screaming because they thought it was real. The thing that happened was Smithsonian Institute heard about that and wanted to send somebody from Washington, D.C. Up, up to this area for the hodag. Well, push came to the shove and the guy lost his courage and no, the hodag is not for real. So, but I've got photographs, I got on the internet, I've got photographs that made this whole they deal with the hodag. Here's what I got for the kids. They're looking at this and here's a deer running through. Well, you know, Mr. Waters, how did you, you what, how did you get that picture? And I said, I was deer hunting. I said, look at that, that thing's scared. Well, that doesn't look real. If, you know, that, the kids had, had me buried right there along the way there. Yeah, so they get a kick out of the whole day. We had the uh, paddlers down at uh, Sealy, and I was showing the, the adults down there the paddlers, and I found but via the grapevine later on that everybody was, yeah, they'd seen a whole day, and they, you know, they're making fun of this whole deal with the whole day. This is the last one with the kids. In unison, the kids would say, the end. And this is the end. It's the end of the thing here. And that's the subject. Yeah, it's good. And you, you have been a real good audience. I, this is the first time I ever got set up with a mic, but they're worried about people be, having things to say here. And I just love to get this. I look back at the crowd, the hands go up, and, and people come up with a 
You can tell what our age is along the way here, can <laughs> you? <laughs> to remember all this stuff. Yeah, and uh, if, if someone does have, a, uh, we've got time for just a couple more questions, or a couple questions before we go on. How many people had ancestors that were in a logging camp up here? Quite a few? Okay, good. Uh, is there any steam donkeys around here? Any what? Steam donkeys. Ah, uh, not that I've seen. Nope. They, I don't know what, what happened to them, whether they took, you know what happened? Warehouser went through Michigan, Wisconsin, got to Minnesota, and guess what happened in the Dakotas? There are nothingness there. You go to the Dakotas, all of a sudden the, the trees aren't there anymore. Went clear out, Warehouser went clear out to the west coast, got into the cedars and the redwoods out there, and I think they probably uh, got those. We did find out, you saw the, uh, the uh, sawmill there in Drummond. Guess who purchased that from Michigan? Ford. Henry Ford bought that and shipped it out there and he got it in a warehouse, never did set it up. And I talked to the uh, Wisconsin Historical, I said, you know, you could really do us a favor if you get somebody out there and buy that back. <laughs> and then we could, we could have it up here, at least have it, uh, what the sawmill looked like. We got pictures of it and everything. We were, when we set up the museum in, in uh, Drummond, we were with the library, which means we're open 12 months of the year. And we had people cleaning out basements and garages and stuff, and you, they bring the stuff in, you know what this is? And that's where that, most of that stuff that we've got in that museum in there, we got it. Then we had the uh, conservation board, uh, stuffed animals. We've even got an eagle in there, bald eagle, that got up in the high lines, and, and George Phillips was, was the guy that got that. So we've got an animal collection in there that you just doesn't quit. But all these things that come in there, we've got the original whistle. Remember the whistle in the morning with the scene whistle? And the, uh, we've, got, we've got the blacksmith shop. We've got photographs of the blacksmith shop. And we have actual things that are in that photograph up there that people brought in. And yeah, there it is. We've got the, the anvil and stuff like that. So our chapter up here, uh, Bayfield County now, we've got 10 chapters. Uh, Bayfield, the city of Bayfield went on their own. But uh, we've got a brochure. I don't imagine you've seen that around that has pictures of all of them. You know, you kind of wonder what to do on a Sunday or a weekend, or you got visitors around there. Why don't you take them to these museums on the on the weekend and just walk walk through there, and it's self-guided. There's no charge for it or anything like that. So it, 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 we're really, we, in fact, we won an award for Bayfield County. We're one of the the counties with the, with the least population that had the most chapters. And that was a government award. We got got that particular one. And yeah. yeah, I am president of Bayfield County by chance. <laughs> we had a meeting, then we're looking for a president, and everybody's sitting around not doing anything. And I, I had to go to the bathroom the, the worst way, so I, you know, I, I got up. And by the time I came back, they congratulated me. <laughs> so every, we have our meetings every year, and I can't get out of it. I don't want to get out of it, because we, we just got a super, super deal up there. But then they wanted a, a pay raise. So I'm thinking, well, we're not getting paid anything. So I figured, well, I'll give them a percentage raise, and I'll, I'll give you a 25% raise in your salary. Well, they're not making anything, so rather than say, well, okay, I'll give you $10 for it. But everybody donates their time. In our meetings, we have once a month somewhere, and uh, have a good time to do that. Uh, it's, it's a going situation here. Okay, I want to take us back to the uh, logging camp dining hall. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard that uh, the uh, men were slow coming in to eat, so they, for each table, say there's 16 at a table, they'd only put 15 slices of bread down. Oh, so if you were last, you didn't get any bread. I, but they did make sure everybody got fed. Yeah, I, I never heard that before, but, but uh, I could say, but they had apple pie, and they, they ate, well, they said three different types of meat and everything else, and you know, these people coming over, they, they don't speak English very well, and and uh, things like that, and and uh, kind of there, they had a kind of a, a joke along the way there. They had an outhouse, and they had a an old guy in there using the outhouse, sitting down. And there's a tall guy, a guy was watching, waiting for his turn around there. The old guy got done pulling up his pants, and a 50 cent piece fell out of his pants and went right down through a crack in the floorboards. The guy looked at him, kind of chuckling about it. The old guy didn't even turn a smile. He just. Put, got his pokey, got a $20 gold piece and threw it down there. 
A guy said, what did you do that for? And the old guy said, you don't think I'm going down there for 50 cents, do you? <laughs> They had all, all kinds of deals here. Any well, other questions? I, 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 yeah, good to prevail on uh, Mr. Waters and see if he'll stick around for a little longer sure. if, for those of you that do have some questions. But I know um, that for some of us, we get up early and we're, we're going to have to bail out. So I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Waters again and all of you for coming. And uh, we appreciate your attendance. We appreciate your loyalty to the um, to the associations that put us on. So thank you very much and thanks, Les. Thank